All right. Welcome everybody to Simply Cyber, Simply Cyber Live. I almost said first things first. Um, guys, we all are, you know, acutely aware of the situation going on in the uh, Eastern Europe, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Um, it, it's a very timely news story. It's, it's very, very current. And there is a lot going on from a battle perspective. And for the first time, we're actually seeing the cyber domain and cyber capabilities uh, manifest into actual military capability. Uh, you'll, you'll hear the term hybrid warfare being thrown around. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity to take a moment, apolitically discuss the kind of timeline of the cybersecurity activities happening within that theater to really study it from an academic perspective and talk about it both from a technical execution perspective, like how was this done and did it make sense? And also from an operational perspective, did it have value? Did it achieve its mission? And we won't get too deep into this, but the reason um, it's curious that there is this hybrid element to it versus just a pure cybersecurity, right? That the, the scenario of always like the next war will be uh, cyber Pearl Harbor and stuff like this. So I think it's going to be a fantastic conversation. I've got an entire timeline built out. I'm going to share it with you. Uh, I'll be quite active on this stream as well, but I don't have that operational theater uh, perspective and experience. And I'm really, really pumped today because we're being joined by Chip Harris, who uh, has worked in the field for quite a while, has some uh, great ICS and OT background, but his his real, um, uh, a lot of his focus and experience has been operating in these kind of conflict theaters um, as an operator and understanding why you would use certain techniques in certain capacities. So I think it's going to be a really interesting, a really enlightened show today. Uh, again, if you've got questions, put a cue in, fire it up. Uh, we'll get our do our best to answer all of them. Again, I, I, I want to emphasize this. This will be an apolitical discussion. I understand that there are a lot of people who are suffering right now, and that is terrible. Uh, but I, I don't want to make this stream about the, the political and the geopolitics and stuff. I really want to focus on the cyber activity and really try to take something from this from an academic uh, and historical perspective, frankly. So let's get Chip up here. Let's dig in. I hope uh, you enjoy the show and thank you for being here. All right, Chip. Good to see you. Thanks for being here, man. How are you? Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Now, really quick, I'm sure many of you are looking at Chip in the first question, so we just get it out of the way. Yes, he he does have his face disguised right now. It is for anonymity purposes, so you're right. not, you know, it's not a, something on your screen. It's not anything like that. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's dig right into what's going on. Now, uh, just to kind of set the stage, uh, you know, Russia has invaded Ukraine in the last you know week or so, and it's been yes. a hot, a hot, a hot story. But this really isn't the first time that um, a cyber capability attack, in in a sense, has occurred from a, a allegedly. And I'll be using allegedly a lot today because I don't want to attribute anything uh, by mistake or whatever. But allegedly, Russia attacked uh, or attacked the energy grid of Ukraine in 2016. Now, the grid was only down for a few hours. Um, it got turned right back on. But as a, you know, a couple days before Christmas, winter, Ukraine, power goes out across the country or across a certain region. I'm not exactly sure, but the power goes out. This can have dire consequences. And it's a, it's a scenario that we talk about um, with, you know, protecting United States critical infrastructure. It's like, oh, they would watch out for the energy grid, you know, uh, and we saw in Texas just last year where the energy yes. went out and it was, a, and there were real consequences. So uh, Chip, just to take a step back here, um, you know, as far as attacking an energy grid of a country, uh, especially with your ICSOT background, you know, uh, and, and don't, don't give a, uh, don't deliver a cookbook on how to do it, but <laughs> you know, how, how might've this manifested and you know, what would be the operational value? What, what might be one reason why this attack, uh, or event occurred? 
So the first thing the operational value is, is that, you know, you are attacking and, and affecting the physical world. That's the first, you know, the, and, you know, as you're talking about, you know, oh, the Ukraine, they lost power to a third of their country, you know, during the height of winter. And, you know, that also affects hospitals, trains. I mean, anything that's a SCADA based, you know, or IOT or uh, OT system cuts off. So, you know, that affects transportation, steam, water, electric, you know, sewage, you know, water treatment. And if you don't have that for two to three, you know, four or five days, maybe into three or four weeks, anarchy will ensue, you know, because you basically go into, you know, a feral, almost survival-based mode to where, you know, you've got to have clean water, you've got to have food, you've got to have, you know, a way and means of communication. I mean, if there's no internet, I mean, and you're relying on a phone and you can't charge your phone after it dies, well, what do you do? You know, you're back to radio communication. So that's, you know, the the technical asset that you're looking that they consider to be in play. Mm -hmm. And when that is actually being affected, you know, there's a lot of, you know, because if you can't communicate, you know, then you can invade. Then, you know, then you can and you're you're basically taking that away from, you know, the peoples and as well as the tacticians because they have no way to communicate with anybody in the field. Yeah, and I'm just looking now at the actual uh, report a little bit closer while you're talking, Chip, and it seems that, you know, there's been an additional insight into this particular malware. I see that BSEC mm -hmm. had mentioned a distributed denial of service, and certainly, and we're going to cover denial of service, believe me, people, coming up in a minute. Oh, yeah. But 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 this particular attack uh, manifested with malware, and I guess Dragos has done an additional analysis to discover that right. um, it was actually intended to cause uh, physical harm, but Apparently, in ICS environments, energy environments, they actually have physical um, fail safes to to fail to kind of uh, yes, like to to segment off these things, and that that was what did it. So it's interesting. It's interesting, Chip. Is it common to have these kind of physical fail safes um, to protect the the I guess the grid? Well, most of your manufacturers have them built in as a safety protocol because, you know, that's regulated by, you know, the, the industry. So, you know, you can have automation within these systems, just like you can automate any other system that's out there. Uh, what made theirs so interesting was it was not completely automated, but it was old enough or just old enough to where if that sensor went down or that valve was turned off, they knew about it and they could go hand crank it on or off. So they could regulate mm -hmm. pressure or flow or whatever they needed to be able to do, you know, and they were affecting the automated systems because they were so old on legacy based, you know, operating systems. So, you know, they were running on, you know, Windows XP service pack one level stuff you know, and they were able to get in and affect those systems because they were so old. Uh, the fail safe is, you know, especially with when you're dealing with like Siemens controllers or ABNB or any of these manufacturers, General Electric, doesn't matter what it is, they do have a safety protocol that will kick in, you know, for to, to where it could be what we call hand cranked or manually cranked. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, uh, one question that, and this, this, this occurred to me, and again, not having kind of operator experience, I have no idea if this is realistic or in, unrealistic, but when I see this and I see it, you know, fail because of this physical thing, it makes me think um, that it's a, it's a trial of capability, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, would this work if we were going to do a full scale invasion and we wanted to start with taking out the power right before we went in, like you, the only way to verify if that would actually work and not overcommit yourself is to test it. Is it is it common or uncommon in kind of operations to to validate in some capacity the the capability uh, prior to actually executing the, the the production operation? Well, like you would run a red team, you know, in a red teaming event, you're going to do recon. You know, you're going to probe those networks. You're going to find out what they're using, what manufacturers they're using, you know, and then hopefully devices. You know, that's one of the key things. So if you're doing a DDoS malware attack, you know, that's a traditional based attack, you know, you're attacking IT systems. When you're attacking OT systems, which is operational technology, it's a whole different mindset because you're having to look at like, oh, this is using SQL and all this over here, but, you know, you switch over to OT technology, it's using ladder logic, you know, it's using something that's machine-based code, mm -hmm. which is completely different. So you have to customize those packages for what it is that you're trying to attack. So, you know, uh, we saw this during Stuxnet, for example, you know, those were specialized coded-based attacks to hit, you know, centrifuges. 
and they knew the hardware, they knew the software, and then they customized that code to be able to, you know, affect those systems. So that's one of the main things that you have to do is when you're doing your reconnaissance and you're doing your information gathering for what, you know, kind of attack that you're trying to customize in the specialize and kind of fine tune, you know, you're going to test that in a sandbox environment. You know, you're going to try to go on the internet and, you know, find the cheap controller, you know, on eBay or wherever it may be and, and try some of these things out, you know, and, uh, you know, supposedly the Russians have an entire unit that just does that. I love it. I love it. So, all right. So that's 2016 energy grid goes down for an hour. It's back up. And we don't hear much more about it. Uh, there is some saber rattling and stuff like that. Let's fast forward the timeline for the Russian-Ukrainian conflict and move it directly into January 14th, um, 2022. So just a couple weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. Russia has this big, splashy uh, takedown of Revil Hacking Group. I believe the Revil Group is operating in Ukraine. FSB gets involved. Right. United, United States had been working on a joint task force, for lack of a better term, with um, the Russia on kind of kind of getting their arms around ransomware, frankly. Um, and this was kind of one of the effects. Now, you got to remember um, this an operation of this magnitude definitely had to have been in the works for at least a couple of weeks, if not longer, for it to be coordinated and all that stuff. So, um, you know, it's going to it's all going to. Uh, uh, spiral out of control in a few minutes, but that's us looking back retrospectively. So when we right. see this, we see Russia coordinating a takedown of a, a pretty major uh, ransomware gang uh, in coordination kind of with the United States. Um, you think, or at least I thought when I saw this and talked about it on First Things First, that this is interesting that they're, they're doing something that seemed a little bit out of character uh, for how they behave. During operations, um, Chip, I mean, would it be uncommon? I mean, it almost seems like not misinformation, but double agent type stuff. I mean, it would it would it is it common or uncommon in order to do something that would appear that you have one alignment when in reality uh, you're actually quite the opposite? Well, you know, it goes back to the old saying: is you know, are you a friend of my friend, a friend of my enemy? You know, mm -hmm. and joint operations that's how they work. You know, they kind of put geopolitics and politics aside and say, okay, this affected your side of the fence and my side of the fence. You know, so. If we work together, even though it might be a little bit strange and a little bit odd, you know, kind of like and a little bit indifferent, but we're trying to get a common goal. You know, that's, you know, Interpol got involved with this. You know, there was a lot of hands that made this happen because it affected not only, you know, the Russian, you know, uh, syndicate that they actually have within their country. It also affected other countries. So there was a lot of geopolitical pressure put on, you know, Russia and the Ukraine, like, we've got to stop this, you mm -hmm. know, and once that comes, you know, because it's not affecting, you know, just one person, it's affecting the collective as a, as a, as a whole. So we just kind of need to, you know, prune the tree a little bit, you know, and, and get this out, you know, and root this out and find out what they're doing, because it, it's going to affect multiple people and multiple players within the network and the systems. Mm hmm. So now this, I found this interesting as I was building this timeline uh, earlier today, because uh, I didn't, you know, these things happen so quickly and you've got so much going on that you don't pay attention. This is January 14th, January 15th, guys, January 15th, literally the next day, destructive malware wiping out uh, Ukrainian organizations. This was the whisper gate, the, the mm -hmm. wiper that was causing mass damage and, um, you know, basically attacking uh, Ukrainian government installations and stuff like that. So, um, you know, certainly, certainly uh, a volley of, you know, uh, an offensive, uh, an offensive mood. There, there's no, you know, th there's no espionage here, right? When you're, when you're using a wiper, you're intending, it's almost like a denial of service if you want to really classify it, because it's, 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 instead of at the network layer, you're denying the service of the, uh, the endpoints, right? or the servers and the, and the file servers and stuff like that. So very, very damaging stuff. As far as uh, destructive malware goes well, in this capacity chip, uh, I guess talk to me about, or talk to us about, you know, A, what, what it might take to write a wiper, or if you can just cobble together stuff from off the shelf. And, you know, how might this have gotten deployed so widely as it did? 
Well, it's just one click on one email. You know, it's it's a it's a it's just one executable, just like anything else. Uh, and the number one main example of that is, you know, when Saudi Ramco was attacked by the Iranians, you know, in the retaliation to Stuxnet, they wiped out, you know, thirty thousand machines with a wiper virus. So, I mean, it, it was a very targeted attack. I mean, it was mm-hmm. not like we're going to blanketly hit the internet and see what we hit, you know, and just kind of a buckshot splatter. I mean, it was a very finite attack to attack this company with these services and attack these parts of the infrastructure, you know, and that's what a wiper virus has done, you know, and, and, and that's, what we see what it can do. I mean, it just bricks out, you know, the BIOS, you know, it destroys the actual, uh, information on the hard drive itself. It tells the platters to kind of unalignment and make the needle scratch through the plates, you know, and sometimes it can even tell the processors to overheat and you basically see your network switches, you know, are just melting internally. You know, they tell them to overclock. So, you know, these are very, you know, simple, easy things to go find out, you know, from, you know, doing internet searches and then to be able to customize your code and your attack, you know, to attack these things. Wiper viruses started about 40 to $50, you know, on the dark net. I mean, they're relatively cheap and it, they're plug and play. You just take the code that you need to, I mean, you can be just a script kitty and just copy and paste what you need into and say, okay, I want to wipe this. I want to attack that. And then I want to be able to, you know, hit North, South, East, West when I get into the system. And I want it to be just a regular batch file executable or a macros or whatever I want it to be attached mm-hmm. to an email excel file you know and then boom send it out as a mass blast to a company and you're ready to go it just takes one click yeah and i know that the um the wiper had affected several um several uh you know government you know entities um Mm -hmm. in ukraine and i'm thinking it's the whispergate one there is the hermetic wiper which we'll talk about in a bit but um you know, it, very coordinated, right? So I, I don't know if right. they use like a logic bomb to detonate it all at the same time, um, you know, or if they use that phishing email to get on the network and then plant it in, in various places. Uh, but certainly it would appear that there was, uh, um, what's it called? Not compromise, but presence on the networks prior to, you know, the 15th when when it dropped, right? It's not like it was a just-in-time wiper where they opened the email, it wiped it instantly and detonated um, so, you know, that, that is interesting. Now, what also, uh, comes up is we're moving on to the 16th, right? The next day, this is fast. It's beginning to fast move, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this is a, you know, you could, you can't really see it, but this is from the Ukrainian, uh, you know, top level domain that the digital.gov.ua. Uh, so I guess this is their press office of their government. Uh, they, they basically flat out say Russia intends to reduce trust in the government, fake, fakes about um, vulnerability, critical information, drain Ukrainian data. So there was some data exfiltration that occurred uh, before the wiping happened, apparently. Uh, And and the defense ministry here, the office, uh, press office is saying that it it didn't have uh, Ukrainian individual uh, sensitive information. You know, like the information that got exfiltrated, they were classifying as less sensitive. Now, Mm -hmm. it is interesting that the wiper is, you know, designed to cause uh, turmoil, obviously disrupt operations of the government itself, but I'm sure it erodes public trust in what is going on. But as far as the data exfiltration happens, uh, we see that with ransomware threat actors, but they're so financially motivated that they're just trying to double dip on selling the decryption key and selling the data. In this capacity, they're exfiltrating it. I'd have to imagine it's for military um value or tactical value. So Chip, what, you know, what are your thoughts around, you know, data exfiltration as part of the operation? Data, it's key. It's one of the number one, th- the more information that you can get, the better, right? You know, so I look at it like this is, you know, um, if you look at the attacks that we had in the United States from China, which affected OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, you know, they got information on tons of different people, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that builds a really great password spray, you know, <laughs> if they're, and the thing though, too, is once you get compromised, you know, or you compromise that base, that, that government based system, you, you want to stay in there as much as you can and be, you know, as subtle and, you know, as silent on the wire as you can to get as much information as you can out in via bulk you know, hopefully and, and slowly take that away and then start building what your attack vectors are going to be, you know, and how you're going to affect 
those multiple layered systems, you know. So, for example, if they say, oh, well, they're a Linux and a Microsoft shop, you know, they've got domains over here. This is where their server rooms are at. Oh, and by the way, these attach to these devices in the real world. This attaches to the steam power plant. This attaches to the water treatment facility, you know, and this. So basically, you know, it's just like any other attack that you're doing, you know, either as a red team or, you know, or as a malicious base hacker or you're doing a black hat event or a pen test. You know, you're going into that system and you're trying to spread through that system, collect as much of that information as you can and then bring that back and then start building out with your teams you know, what kind of, you know, infrastructure you're going to be able to hit, what kind of Mm -hmm. systems, you know, they are, and then where are they actually physically located? That's the key thing is location, 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 just like real estate. If I take out this one thing, does it have a domino effect of taking out others? And if you can find that weak link in the chain, you win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is fascinating. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 like when you put it that way, it's like the value of like the, the you know, individual population information is, is like, it's almost inconsequential, uh, you know, because it's not like they're just trying to sell a co- and make a couple bucks on the dark web. I mean, it's, it's really about recon, right? I mean, I guess that's, it's, that's always the first step of any operation, right? Is, is reconnaissance right. and you're constantly iterating over that recon phase. So, yeah, Jesus. All right, so so continuing on into the month of January, guys, running right down the timeline, the Department of Homeland Services on the 24th, so this is about a week later, uh, you know, Ukraine and, and Russia are still kind of jawing at each other. It seems like it's tempered down. And the 24th comes out, and DHS warns of potential Russia cyber attack. Now, what's interesting is, and we'll see this as CISA... Uh, releases joint memos with DHS and stuff that they always say there is no credible intel to suggest that there will be an attack. In but, theory, in theory, I want to inject that in theory. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Like, so for public consumption, there's no credible intel? That is correct. I mean, there's what you can give to the generalized public that's going to be non classified data versus TS data or top secret based data. And if, you know, and you have, you know, the three eyes, the five eyes and stuff like that. And when we information share with each other, as I tell people, you know, they're not going to try to scare the general public saying that these things are going to happen because panic and chaos will ensue. That's just how human beings are, Mm -hmm. is they try to subtly keep telling people, hey, you need to patch for this. There's zero days for this. See these CVEs that are out here? They keep, you know, pushing that narrative because they know something like this is going to happen because we're seeing it, you know, on the other side of the fence. And we're seeing like, okay, there's a buildup. This is going to happen. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I guess it makes sense. I mean, um, you know, there's a reason that elected officials are put in place. There's a reason that there is classified information uh, right. especially if it's, if it's not, if it's not actionable for the population, but it's actionable mm-hmm. for, you know, the United States military or for NATO forces, um, et cetera. So, uh, that, that is a good point. And we will see that, you know, as I said, DHS continues to, uh, promote different things. Now things go quiet guys from the 24th, uh, to February 15th, things go quiet. So I don't know, uh, what you guys are doing, like Super Bowl. We're all talking about the Coinbase QR code. Like, you know, yeah, there's there's tensions going on in the Eastern Europe, but it just it seems like kind of more of the same kind of uh, big, you know, not bullying, but the same of like uh, allegedly Russia kind of testing cyber uh, attacks and, and, and mechanisms and capabilities on Ukraine, much like we saw in 2016 mm-hmm. in, in Estonia in 2007. So you know, it, it's not causing panic, right? Or alarm. Well, February 15th, we then see a distributed denial of service attack on Ukraine's defense ministry. And um, it doesn't say it here, but the the bank, I, I guess I'm not Ukrainian or, or have ever been there or anything, but I, apparently they have like a major bank, like it's the Ukraine bank. Yes. And that it's one- It's basically like their national bank or federated bank that controls a lot of their actual monies. Okay. Okay. So they were attacked by a distributed denial of service attack and and some other, uh, some other, uh, the defense ministry was as well. Also, there was some website defacement. Now, Mm -hmm. when I see this and this, this will end up being kind of the initial uh, volley of what will become an invasion. But when I see this, um, and and I guess let's talk about it from a technical perspective for a second, Chip. 
distributed denial of service attack, okay? There are a couple ways to do it. Uh, one of the, I guess, more popular ways, if you want to call it, is having all of these kind of IoT devices compromised or you have open memcache servers. You, you basically mm -hmm. have devices on the internet that are commandable, uh, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term, right? And you point them all at a target. And in this case, it would be private bank web server and these defense ministry web servers. Uh, yes. That's the extent of my knowledge with these things, because I've only ever studied them academically. I've never participated in these things. Uh, is there any kind of color or or dimension or perspective you'd like to add to this, you know, to a distributed denial of service attack and using the Ukrainian one, uh, perhaps as a case study? Well, I do DDoS attacks all the time. So, I mean, it, from a technical standpoint of view is when you're building that mesh network out, you know, and you're compromising all these IoT systems you're basically creating, they're like zombies, you know, they're, they're, you know, and the more that you have, the better, you know, and when you focus them all on that one single IP address or that one single domain or that one AA record, you know, from a technical standpoint of view, and you're just basically pounding it, mm -hmm. you know, there's, all, there's so much buffer overflow that a network can take. There's so much, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if it's cloud or on-prem or, or, or so forth. There's only a threshold that it can only take so much before it's just completely flooded, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that you can do that with halo and high low attacks, you know, uh, uh, which are out there. And the other thing though, too, is they're very, they start off very slow and they build up, you know, uh, only, only unless you do what we call a crash attack. You know, you're crashing everything into the network. You're throwing everything you possibly can at it and seeing if you're going to be able to punch a hole or just completely take everything down. So, you know, the well, hold more on. That... let me, let me, let me back you up for a second there. So I, I don't understand this. When you say start slow and go, like when I think distributed denial of service attack, I think it's like a starter pistol goes off and 500,000 bots just spew uh, data at, yep. at a system. So it, if it starts slow and grows, like how, like, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? So, you know, I'm going to hit like, for example, one IP address and I'm going to say, okay, what's blocking it? You know, how long does the TTL take it to, to, to block, to block that first attack? Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I'm going to say, okay. And I know that I've got four other, other IPs that are within that network and I hit those and I kind of say, okay, it took, you know, seven milliseconds here, 10 milliseconds here, two minutes here, and then five hours over here for a response. So which one am I going to attack first? I'm mm -hmm. going to hit the five hour one because they're not going to know. Right. You know, so that's, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're just pinpricking, you know, and then starting out and then you're going to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start hitting it with, you know, IOT devices. Then I'm going to start hitting it with cloud. Then I'm going to start hit and I'm building that up you know, and I'm hitting that five hour one and then it's like, boom, 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 boom. And then suddenly, you know, I'm throwing everything at it all at once. So it's just basically just kind of like a pneumatic hammer. It just starts off hitting very slowly and it starts chipping a little bit away. And then all of a sudden it just cracks into everything. Mm. So, okay. Now, uh, before going into the impact of that, the other aspect of this was web server defacement, right? So if you went to mm -hmm. privatebank.ua it, it basically said, we are watching you, WAF, which I don't even know what that means, but whatever. It's definitely not your login credentials to the bank. Um, so, you know, okay, so you're obviously denying the, the, the public access to this bank. But as far as attacking a web server and defacing it, I mean, that was huge and popular in the late 90s, early 2000s, when people didn't know what the hell, <laughs> what they were doing. And, you know, it's 2022, and this is a you know, effectively a, a, a premier bank in a country. How may, how may they have defaced that, that web server? Well, I mean, if you're using WordPress, it's not that hard, you know, and I mean, it only takes, you know, one open pixel and then you can inject, you know, your code all day long, you know, mm -hmm. and, and deface that site. The other thing though, too, is, is, you know, uh, you know, for your Java or that you're using on your site and everything, you know, are your comments opened and closed, you know, I mean, you really have to, you know, if you know how to read, read a web page, you know, you can find holes in it, you know, is your JSON open? Is this not open? I mean, and that's how you're going to start building out you know, how you're going to be able to do your defacement. I mean, you can hit, you know, F12 on your keyboard right now and see the code, you know, from Google, you know, th mm -hmm. that's actually late there in the background, you know, and then do a control F and type in Java and then boom, it's going to tell you what version of Java you're using. 
okay, well now I know which version of Java, you know, if it's an older website and they don't keep it up, you know, upkeep and maintained. And so even if it's an exchange server, you know, I'm going to find those things out and then I want to be able to specialize my attack to hit those things. Yeah. Okay. So uh, great point. So even in 2022, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do the boring, you gotta do the boring stuff, people. I hate to admit it. You gotta do it. You know I mean? It's (laughs) like, you know, you just can't build a website, you know, in Wix and just throw it on the net and then, yeah, it works, you know, and then not do, you know, normal control PM maintenance like you should be doing. Yeah. Hope is not a strategy. Uh, Yeah. Hope is not a strategy. Never has been. (laughs) So, so one last thing about this that I want to talk about, because because this will result at, or this will end up becoming kind of the initial um, volley, as I said. To yeah, this the, is a shot it, across the bow. <laughs> yeah, the, the impending invasion. Oh, so yeah. um, when I saw this, you know, I'm thinking denial of service attack. It's kind of like, again, not being an operator. I think a denial of service attacks is, is kind of crude, right? Like you can, if you can get a botnet and you just point it at, you can even rent botnets and point it. So you don't have to be a nation state level operator. Like you can be anyone. And the impact of it is only as a long as you're maintaining the, 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 the service uh, or the, the mm-hmm. stream basically. Right. So it's not really a long-term impact and defacing a website is annoying, but it doesn't really damage the business um, so to me, I was thinking the impact is uh, eroding the confidence and disrupting the sense of safety that the Ukrainian population would feel knowing that it was likely uh, Russia or allegedly Russia and that there was you know, rumblings of uh, troop movement and stuff like that. So how often would it, would something like this, like a cyber attack, be used with the I- implicit um, goal well, of eroding the, public confidence? Right. The cyber attack builds into a psyop attack, you know, okay. a psychological attack. It's like, well, I can't get my money. You know, the, 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 the Internet's down. I can't get my money. The bank is the bank's gone offline. I mean, this builds into creating hysteria you know that's your psyop and, and that and that's what you want to do right mm-hmm. is you're you're denying the ability for people to communicate like i just originally said just a little while ago the able to get funds you know to be able to feed themselves or be able to buy stuff and then you're eroding the confidence that the government is there to protect you you know so in other words it builds you know discontent it builds anger it, you know that's a, that is a classic example of a psyop you know you know operation is that you're trying to fake news i love how we use that term a lot fake news a lot of this kind of stuff so it builds in you know the erosion there of trust which you know which we all love to say that word you know, trust of the government, trust of the bank, trust of the system, trust of the network, you know, and it's like, wow, if, if nothing's working and it's not working for in my favor, you know, and, and especially nowadays in our society, you know, we want things instantaneously, you know, uh, it builds into that kind of erosion, you know, and that's the word I like to use uh, of just like, you know, and, and the analogy I've always used, is just like waves coming in and pulling back the sand, you know, it's going to keep, you know, the waves are going to keep coming, you know, they're going to keep coming and coming and coming. They're going to keep pounding the sand, you know, as much as they possibly can. And especially if you left a footprint there, eventually it's going to wash off. So the, yes, it's, it's, it's a low level crude. And I love how you use that word crude attack, but the psychological effects last longer because people will talk about that. It's the rule of 10. I tell one person, they tell another person, it tells 10, you know, it builds into building like 10 people. Then those 10 people tell another 10 people. And, then it keep, and you see, it just spreads that discontent and it spreads that misinformation and it spreads all throughout, you know, uh, the country. Mm. So the following day on February 15th, or that same day, February 15th, like things start moving quite rapidly. In fact, I, I want to just take a minute and share this screen with everybody just to give you like appreciation because when you see it mapped out it's actually quite uh interesting so and i'll I'll go back to the web pages in a second but when you actually look at this thing mapped out right this is the beginning of it across time okay guys you see the Mm -hmm. dates in orange you see the stories um the the height of the blue line is just to make it so they don't overlap the green titles but look at this is january a couple things are happening a couple things pop up and then it's radio silence. 
And then all of a sudden, a flood just starts cascading in. This is what we're talking about today. But just like it, it really starts going hot and heavy there uh, pretty quickly, as you would imagine. I guess, Chip, uh, you know, as I fix the screen and everything, um, talk about the importance of speed and, uh, you know, rapid execution of an operation. Oh, I mean, oh it, speed is everything. Yeah. <laughs> you want to do as much as you possibly, you know, can as fast as you possibly can to slow their response time. OK, so uh, and I'm going to go back into the OT world. If I cut the power, the next thing I want to do is I want to cut the water. Then, you know, then I want to cut the water treatment facility. Then I want to be able to cut off any kind of like a cogeneration of power or free power. So that's solar, you know, anything that I can, wind turbines, whatnot. I basically want to start attacking. This. So, it's, you know, they're like, oh, we just got this one fixed. Oh, Jesus, this one went down. Oh, geez, this one went down. This one went down. So they're they're basically, you know, having to run around with their heads cut off, you know, trying to get a bill to get stuff fixed. So the more that you attack, the faster that you attack and the faster you speed of your attack, you know, the more successful it is, you know, because you're knocking out those systems. Boom, 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 boom. And it's not like you can just control alt delete a power plant. You know, it just doesn't work that way. You yeah. can't control alt delete a nuclear reactor. It just doesn't work that way. You know, I've explained this to our government. I've explained it to, you know, to multiple, you know, I've screamed about it for years is that, you know, those, once those things go down, there's a graceful shutdown period to where the, you know, you have to shut them down. There's a cooling off period and then you got to rev them back up. I mean, you know, and it's it's the simplicity of it is is that you know these are very simple things to be able to get into but they affect so much so quick so fast because you know if you've ever been through a power outage what's the first thing you do you pick up the phone you call somebody hey when's the power coming back on blah blah you go on social media you find out you try to start communicating well if i cut all that off and you don't know anything you know congratulations, you know, I win, you know, because, you know, you got everybody asking, when's the power going to be back on? If it is not going to be back on for two weeks, congratulations, you know, same yeah. thing. If I, if I turn, you know, it's, um, you know, Westinghouse, which is the number one producer of IOT and OT technology inside nuclear reactors, you know, if they gain access to, you know, the nuclear reactor and are able to Rick roll that system and be able to get in there, how many Chernobyls do you want to have? You know, I mean, it's these things have cascading, catastrophic, you know, effects on reality. You know, as I tell people, IT affects, you know, the Internet and, and you know, your laptop and stuff like that and your server room and whatnot. OT affects the physical world. You know, SCADA based systems and OT technology affects, you know, physically you. So, you know, and that's the scary thing when you start seeing these things rev up is, you know, that's what you want to do. You want to start hitting them pound, 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 pound to start knocking them out because the faster that you do it, the longer the time is for them to get them spun back up. Yeah. And, you know, another thing, um, and again, I'm not 100 percent sure if this actually works in that world or not, but in, in my world, oftentimes, you know, if one thing goes down, it's pretty obvious what to put back up. If you have several things go down, like in a disaster scenario, a lot of organizations are supposed to do this, but they don't do it. Most of them don't do it. Is what is the what is the most critical thing, and what other things have dependencies, right? Like you can't just you can't just turn on the last thing that went up and then work your way back in like a Philo format because maybe mm -hmm. this machine doesn't come up unless this one is up or it starts spewing information and it bricks this machine. So. Um, you like, again, it, 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 it has serious, uh, ramifications when you're doing multiple right. things in a rapid and, way. And most of these systems were not meant to ever be put on the internet. You know, I've explained that multiple times, you know, if you've got a diesel electric generator, okay, for example, they call it a cogen. It's basically a jet engine, you know, and it's spinning and it's spinning. And I slam the brakes on that thing, you know, with an injection code or a virus or denial of service tech, or I knock that controller off and it slams on the brakes, the 50 foot wide by 40 foot hole deep, you know, explosion that's going to happen in the ground and the blades, you know, from the fan, from the turbines are going to shoot about a mile and a half, two miles up in the air and come raining down on people. That's a bad day, you know, yeah. and it's not like you can go to Walmart and order one of these things off the shelf. I mean, they, you know, they weigh 40 tons, you know, they, it takes physically a lot of effort to move one, 
you know, and they're one-offs. You know, these things are not readily available. It takes a lead time between six to eight months up to a year to get one started to build, you know, and these things are meant to last long periods of time. And, th and the other part of that, though, too, is is when you're doing an attack, if you've got one system that goes down and it knocks out another and they're, they're codependent on each other, there's thousands of sensors that might be involved. There's mm -hmm. thousands of different endpoints. So how do you narrow that down? It's very, very hard. So if I knock out a hundred sensors, you know, and they go into safe mode and they're not, you know, connected to a system, you know, to where I can take them out of that safe mode, I physically have to go to those devices and turn them back on because they're a SIM card. That's all it is. It's a SIM card inside a lunchbox. You know, it's got a bunch of wires plugged into it, mm -hmm. you know, and if it loses its code, I really better make sure I've got, you know, I know what that thing was doing before I put the code back onto it on that little SIM card to enable that machine. Yeah. So it might screw up sensors. It might send things offline. It might, you know, kick more stuff off. So you might have a catastrophic failure that basically is a rolling failure that go through multiple sensors and multiple different systems. Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. It's ugh. and it's not easy either. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. So uh, let, let's let's keep let's keep going. Um, so you know, February sixteenth. Um, Ukrainian people are now worried. Uh, there's obviously some attacks. Um, CISA, Jen Easterly's group, do love it, uh, advises, you know, basically clear defense contractor networks or basically everybody um, about uh, a lot of activity by Russian state sponsored actors in, in the uh, space and, and letting them know that they need to be worried about um, Brute force tech, like basically all the normal things that you would expect, brute force techniques, spear phishing email, harvested credentials, all these other things. Essentially, this, this report comes out in the way that I interpreted it, and I felt like many other people interpreted it as we've just gone from like uh, DEF CON green light to DEF CON yellow light. Like it just heightened, <laughs> heightened alert, right? Be, be uh, uh, aware, right? So, so that happens on the 16th. Interesting. You don't see this very often. On de February 18th, two days later, the United States comes out and attributes, um, I want to make sure I, I say this right, I'm, I'm almost positive. This is the one where they, it, this title does not tell you what it's going on, but in this briefing, they attribute that denial of service attack that we just saw three days earlier to Russia. Now, let's let's take a moment and talk about attribution, Chip, okay? So the United States in three days is able to attribute an attack to a country, which normally doesn't happen or it happens months, months, months later. And even then they just say, we have high confidence that it was this threat, uh, this, this APT, not definitively attributing it. So t tell us about, um, you know, in this case, how attribution may have been given or what is the challenge with attribution? And, and, and on the other side of it, as an operator, how you make, attribution more difficult well as much as i hate to say it it's what you can get away with you know that that's the major problem we have right now because we don't have any treaties on the internet you know and it's what i call tick for tack warfare you know right now you know it's like what they can get away with i can get away with what they can do to me i can hit them back and, and, and basically it's like a tennis match you're just watching the ball go across the fence back and forth and, you know, it, it's not that hard to figure out who did what and how they did it. I mean, because you only in Russia, you have two units. That's it. You've got the GRU, you know, and then you have the SVR. And, and it's it's basically, you know, those two units that are going to do it, you know, and they have a certain style and they have a certain way of doing these things. And it's not that hard to figure these things out. Now, it, it comes back to if they hit the Ukraine, what can the Ukraine do back to them? Right. Well, they're not going to come out and, and blatantly say and tell what they're going to do, you know, as a retaliation. So it, it's very, very hard because we don't have, you know, peace treaties and we don't have the normal stuff that we do in a kinetic war, you know, which is, you know, firing bullets and guns and bombs and tanks, you know, shooting shells at each other versus what we could do on the wire, you know, because there's no. There's no Interpol on the wire. There's there's no police on the wire, really, to be honest, you know, and it's what you can get away with, you know, and what you can do. And, uh, you know, and can you prove it? That's 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 really what, the, what it boils down to is what you can and can't prove that this state nation did to you. And then what's the impact of that either on your government or your business? 
Yeah. So at the end of the day, there's very little capability uh, for just in time attribution. And it's really just studying TTPs, essentially. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you see a rogue, you know, API that's hitting you and I mean, how can you really prove that, you know, well, that actually came from a domain in Texas, which, you know, they jumped off a proxy server in, let's say, Hong Kong that jumped off another server that was in, you know, Serbia, uh, uh, Bosnia, Escarvina, that was actually in Kazakhstan that's connected to Russia. I mean, you know, it's how can you prove that one of these other point, you know, points didn't do it, you know? Mm -hmm. considering it's jumping around the world. I mean, you, there's no real way to say, well, that's the threat actor, you know, and point a finger directly at them. But, you know, you can approximate just by the techniques used, you know, and what was done and the stylization of how this was done. Because, you know, we know how bears attack, which is basically, you know, the Russians. We know how, you know, cats attack, which is Iran. That's how they, they call them, you know, like a cat attack. So we kind of get an idea over time how these guys stylize and do a lot of these different things so and that's how we kind of build into well yeah the russians did it because look what they did they did xyz that checks the, these boxes of them doing that before we've seen from history you know these things and then we can see how we can build that into a retaliatory attack you know upon them but then you say okay if they can do it to us, we can do it to them. And then really, you know, there's, you know, where does it end? You know, and that's a very, and especially when you're doing this to OT systems and you're affecting the physical world, that's a mm -hmm. very scary thing. That's a very scary thing. And we right now are standing at that crossroads of, well, if they hit us and we hit them, where's the end? Because there's no end to that road right now. Yeah. You know, mutual destruction. <laughs> it is total. It, it is. I mean, I it's just, you know, People say it's mutual destruction on both sides, and it absolutely is, because it's like, if I turned off Moscow, they're going to turn off the east or west coast, you know, so, and, and then we say, oh, well, then, then they attack Canada, what's Canada going to do to help, you know, the U.S., because they're an ally, and then we got to attack them, I mean, it's, it's what you can get away with, uh, literally, I mean, it's not like I'm driving a tank across their border, you know, and causing an incursion into their land, <laughs> you know, the internet has no bounds, <laughs> That's funny. Um, so, okay. So I, I, all right. So thank you on the attribution point. Now I found this fascinating, which I just double checked because for a second I was like, why, why is this now? Check this out. Going back to our timeline. So this is the 18th of February where CISA releases that guidance of uh, regarding a Russia Ukraine conflict uh, likely. Now check this out. This is the graphic. You'll notice that right here on the 19th, 20th, 21st, it's noticeably quiet. I just looked at my, my calendar and that's literally the weekend. So everybody, apparently everybody's working for the weekend chip because yeah, hey man, you know, I am Russia, too. Ukraine, <laughs> United States, NATO, like no, nobody's doing anything over the weekend. And I'm sure just in full disclosure, I'm sure something happened and it just didn't come up in yeah. my, in my, but I mean, hackers collection. like the party, man. That's how it is. You yeah, know, look at yeah. that. I mean, we're, we're pulling 14, 16 hour days to do this attack. Dude, it's a nine to five job. I mean, that's that's how they look at well, it. And yeah, it exactly. It's true. <laughs> maybe lining up, maybe lining up their uh, their Tinder dates, which we'll we'll get into in just a minute, whether or not that's true. <laughs> that's great. But, so, so February twenty second comes <laughs> that that Tuesday, right after President's Day. So thanks for uh, you know the world recognizing one of our holidays. Yeah, and, thanks for taking the day off, hackers. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so U.S. officials come out and tell businesses. Now remember, CISA released an advisory mm -hmm. on Thursday, the week before that defense sector cleared uh, organizations should be on the lookout for uh, Russian state-sponsored actors uh, operating on them. Four days later, it comes out that potential ransomware attacks might be coming uh, in direct response to the impending sanctions, which we end up finding out is massive economic sanctions that ended up uh, mm. crushing the ruble, disconnecting Russia from SWIFT in several cases, um, and, and thinking that the rebuttal might be a ransomware attack. So again, it's uh, it's a, you know, I, I guess DEFCON 5 to DEFCON 3, I got corrected by someone in here. I didn't know the direction of the DEFCONs. Uh, but basically, you know, everybody now, DEFCON yellow light, be aware, make sure your backups are tight, make sure, you know, insurance right. is going to be fine, but that's not really what you want in this case. You want to prevent the attack from happening. So, you know, I, I don't know about you, Chip, in, in my space, um, this is a good opportunity. So this is one of those ones where, and cyber is unique in this way that 
there's no military battlefield, right? We operate on the same bat, uh, internet that is the battlefield internet of these um of these Sir, businesses. I could not have said it better. We are all on the same playing field. As I, I've tried to explain this a million times. We're all we're all on the same plane. It doesn't matter. It's not like there's somebody that's better than us. That's better than no. We're all we're all equal on this on this level. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and to that point, you know, when there's a conflict, unless you're like in downtown battle zone, um, you know, that there's no there's no advisories or, or 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 you know guidance coming out to businesses, right, to the private sector to be be concerned or be worried. Again, unless you're in the battle zone. Uh, so I found this as not precedent setting, but very, very interesting as again, we're dealing with a modern conflict where cyber mm -hmm. is a domain. Okay. So fast forward two days later, February 24th. Now we'd already seen this wiper virus called Whispergate, but now we've got another one, this one called hermetic uh, wiper. And the reason they call it hermetic is basically because there was a company I didn't dig into this, but interesting, a company that was stood up less than a year ago um, that sells some software or something. And the company's mm -hmm. name was Hermetica. And they're the ones who um, it was their software or it was tied to their company somehow where the wiper occurred. Now, the question for you, Chip, as an operator, we've already covered wipers just already in this conversation. So I don't want to rehash that. But as an operator, let me ask you this. How often or how realistic is it to plant multiple versions or iterations of a similar attack uh, because maybe as a contingency or as a, uh, a timed response or what, why, why, would, why would they have a second wiper? And we find out just today, yesterday, I think, there's a third wiper called Fox something. Um, wh why would there be multiple wipers? Uh, can, you, can you discuss? So, for example, like, you know, you got Petya, non-Petya, right? It's just mm -hmm. another iteration of some of the things that we've seen in the cyber world they're going to do with multiple wipers. Because guess what? I might be able to wipe out one part of the network, but the other one's still up and running. Well, guess what? I want to have another wiper virus to hit that one. And then let's say they've got failover in the cloud, right? they got a C2 instance. I want a wiper to hit that one because it's specifically cloud-based, you know, for their backup. So this is, you know, the same thing that we've seen in the IT world, you know, is the same thing we see some of the problems in the OT world. If I wipe out, you know, for example, some of the heating and cooling units of the HVA system, or what they call BAS, building automation system, right, at a hospital, for example. And I'm going to use a hospital because I work a lot with medical. And now everybody is, is boiling hot, freezing cold, right? So now I've, you know, wiped that system completely. And let's say that, you know, we have got the air condition turned on during a cold front, you know, or during a bomb, bomb cyclone or winter. So now everybody's freezing in the hospital. It's freezing outside. They got no heat whatsoever. Then I'm going to say, oh, cool. Well, then that wiper, you know, is also connected to the same CVE system that connects to the elevators. So let's turn off all the escalator and the elevators, right? Let's wipe that system out. And then you see how I'm building into hitting mm -hmm. multiple different layers of that OT system. So let's say I take out, you know, the HVAC, I take out the way of going up. And let's say I get into the building automation system and lock all the doors. Nobody can get around from floor to floor. They're all locked in. You know, because most, you know, floors have magnetic doors. Better yet, let's turn the sprinkler system on. Well, it's freezing cold outside and you got the HVAC, you know, pumping out, you know, 30 degree, you know, and then turn, and then, then, then turn off the chillers, you know. So guess what? I mean, and wipe those systems out completely, you know, because those are vendor based systems and they're one off systems. They, they're dependent now on the vendor in the middle of a snowstorm to try to get to them to fix that system. And if you knock out their internet and say they're connected to the internet and they got a timed live or they got some kind of gold platinum plan to where they got online, you know, 24 and you kill that internet connection in that circuit, right? Congratulations. You won, you know, that hospital, they're going to be evacuating people within two to three hours, especially out of the NICU where the babies are at. And especially out of, you know, anybody that's in the ICU or COVID units, they're going to be getting them out because, they're going to try everything they can to save them because that's what they do is save lives. But I have now turned on the air conditioning, turned off, you know, the, the turned on the sprinkler system. Now they're freezing to death and freezing water, you know, in the middle of a snowstorm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are real life scenarios that I write about, you know, and give these to clients to kind of explain to them. These are why these systems, you know, are so vulnerable and need to be treated, you know, just like you would any other system that's within your network, that's within your tree. It's a different tree. Don't get me wrong, you know, because it's not dealing with, for example, your SQL data. But it's just important as that SQL data because guess what? I'm attack attacking the physical world while that's attacking, you know, patient records, for example, mm -hmm. or, yeah, an, that, uh, or a Cerner or something like that. You know, something that's, a, you know, an ICS system or something that's, a, that's depending on patient records. Yeah. And the wiper doesn't even account for, I mean, you're basically blasting the, whoever, whatever those systems are back, back into the dark ages. Because, again, with the with the speed at which this thing's moving um you know and the problem is is that the networks that for these are inherently flat okay yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're they are inherently flat they're not next gen you know level two level three i mean they are incredibly flat networks so it's no different than an attack in a hub you know as i tell people it, it you know and once you get into them it's like congratulations now i've got access to all the ports you know on the switch so i can turn off whatever i want even at the switch level so it makes it even worse yeah so the, the official invasion, as is, is near as I can tell, happened uh, on the evening of the 23rd, morning of the yeah, 24th. The 23rd. Someone fact checked yeah. me on that, but I, I think that's it. And you could see on that day, I mean, there was there was many events that happened. So not, not surprising that it would coincide, right? Uh, it appears that, you know, uh, maybe that initial denial of service attack the week before or two weeks before, whatever it was, was literally just, a, a, you know, you know, taking taking the boat out for the 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 the, voy the first voyage of the season just to make sure that the engine worked and everything because remember, we see it, remember it's a pneumatic hammer you're cracking away you remember you're hitting yep. you're hitting you're hitting and that's where you saw those previous attacks they're building that crack and they're ready to now crack you know the dam you know and the little Dutch boy can only stick his fingers in so many holes at once <laughs> <laughs> exactly so so. Uh, so the attacks uh, about to begin, and again, so now we've got this denial of service. Now, to, to let let's take it in a different direction, Chip, for a second. Again, I don't know with one hundred percent certainty the validity of this story, but it is a great story, and it it allows us to talk about OPSEC. So, really quick, um, again, again, people, I am not a, a well traveled person, so I might get this wrong, but um, the. Many of you saw this. The Russian invasion occurred across many different points of the Ukrainian countryside, okay? And a bunch of troops amassed outside of a city called, Kar Kar uh, not Kharkiv. It, it, they're going to be uh, moving into Kharkiv, but there's a place in like Belarus or something like that where um, th th that they're going to amass and then they're going to come in to Kharkiv, okay? So that's, that's the battle strategy. Mm -hmm. Guys, deploy your troops. Um, get them all ready, get them all supplied up, put them, put them over here. And then at first light attack. Okay. So you've got these, uh, soldiers, these Russian soldiers who got nothing to do, but you know, nothing but time on their hands. They, they apparently hop on Tinder and they've got themselves, you know, holding a rifle, got them in the striped shirt. And apparently in this case, uh, a Ukrainian woman or women jumped on Tinder and noticed because Tinder is proximity based geolocation, right. proximity based, all of these new people started popping up in her, in her network. Uh, and she started talking to a couple and, you know, basically really poor operational security. These individuals disclosed to her that they are you know, Russian soldiers, whatever. The fact that their profile photos literally show them in Russian soldier gear with rifles and such. Um, and, you can see on the Tinder map or whatever that there's this large pool of them all up uh, in the city, uh, basically laying out that there is a force there. Uh, and why else would they be there other than for likely an impending attack? Now, the story goes on to say that she actually disclosed to intelligence or to Ukrainian government officials or some somehow somewhere. That, and that's why I'm not sure about the story, but that this was happening and it allowed uh, Ukraine to mount a little bit better defense. I think Kharkiv actually fell today or yesterday, but um, but but it allowed them to mount a little bit more defense. So from an operational security, take it in any different way you want, Chip, with with this story. But from an OPSEC <laughs> perspective, um, and you know, what do you think about this? And from an attacker perspective, how can you exploit OPSEC in order to improve your recon? Well, first off, that here's hands off that lady. Way to go! I mean, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, to me, 
it's the same thing as Google, you know, and a lot of these other companies that are IT based are getting involved. They turned off Google Maps, you know, to mm-hmm. the Ukraine. And I give the indigenous people, you know, of Ukraine, you know, thumbs up. They went and took all the road signs down. So it's like these guys are going to start <laughs> driving around. And they don't know where they are because guess what? They can't pull up Google Maps, which is awesome. You know, way to go, Google. Do no evil, even though I have my reserve about you guys. But, you know, it's also that they, they, they have – they're communicating with the real world and they're not thinking about, hey, this is giving off a geolocation of, you know, where somebody might be able to shoot a missile at me. I mean, that's, you know, it's the same thing that we did in the military in the United States is we, we banned Fitbits because, you know, people could hack a Fitbit account and then be able to find out exactly their geolocation and then be able to map out, you know, a base or be able to map out, you know, a facility of where they're located at or whatnot. So, I mean, it's kind of the same thing, you know, wearable tech, you know, uh, has, has its inherent flaws. Same thing is, you know, your signal in your phone carrier is now telling you exactly where the bad guys are at and Hey, go mount a strike against that. That's beautiful. That's awesome. I I love the whole idea, you know, that, that that she did this and then kind of turned that in because that's really thinking outside the box. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, what a lot of people in especially doing what I do in our, our, in our industry is we call it abstract forward thinking is, you know, people are going to think within the group think within a certain box. Our job is to think beyond and out that, you know, from mm-hmm. an OPSEC standpoint, because, you know, it's the the ability to use the one thing that most people don't like and want to use that's dangerous, which is creativity. And she was being very creative on seeing technology that's being used out in the field and then finding an exploit based around the human nature of, you know, trying to find a date or procreate to find out exactly where the bad guys are at and for the good guys to go drop bombs on or whatever, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's just very, that's, that's awesome to me for I, hey, way to go. That's a, that's <laughs> way to go lady. I, I applaud you. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So we, we are getting close to time, but I do have a couple more things I want to cover sure. because I do, I do find it's important. Uh, so just to round out the idea of the big tech uh, effect, right? So we saw earlier today, well, let's keep it on the timeline, Jerry. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, this is February 26th, a couple days later after the uh, initial invasion uh, or attempted invasion, we see the defense minister, I think, don't, you know, fact check me on that, but definitely an official within the, the Ukrainian government, uh, mm-hmm. send at Elon Musk a tweet and basically just says like, can you put internet over Ukraine, please? And Elon Musk within 10 hours responds, Starlink service is now active in Ukraine. Uh, it, it did require sending physical terminal boxes to Ukraine, which did show up two days later. They did show up two days later. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, this is unbelievable. Like They got like, them in. I mean, they smuggled them in through Poland. I was like, awesome. So, you know, the, the Ukrainians now have the ability to communicate while, the you know, they've shut the Russians out, you know. I said, you know, the first thing that they should have done is since we control all the domain nomenclature in the world, in the United States, was, you know, turn off their domain, like, globally you know do a, a a worldwide global domain block that now there were a lot of people that agreed with me that i was talking to about this but they were like going uh that's kind of one of those things we can't turn back on really relatively easily because we saw that during the arab spring you know with egypt you know uh and i was going well, why don't we do the same thing you know in russia why don't mm-hmm. we just completely cut off all of their domain you know their their domain you know from ICANN? and they're like uh good idea but a last resort. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's funny. Uh, and so I, I now I'm going to start disrupting a little bit from the um, from the timeline. But just to close out kind of the big tech uh, influence, we've seen a couple other things happen. One, we've seen uh, basically all the social media giants like Twitter and um, Facebook, Meta, uh, et cetera, Instagram, basically taking down um, misinformation accounts, propaganda account, Russian propaganda accounts, Mm -hmm. and stifling the amplification of those messages. So you can't, you can't have a hundred thousand bots uh, thumbs up or like a post. So it gets, so the algorithm picks it up and spreads it. They're, they're squashing that. Um, So I, I guess let's talk about that for a second. As far as doing the psyops element and the misinformation campaign, or disinformation campaign, depending mm-hmm. on what your objectives are, how crippling is it, or is it not, uh, for this 
response to happen where basically these accounts are being removed and the message is being stifled, effectively uh, crippling that capability for well, uh, Churchill Russian... said it best: whoever writes the narrative is the winner. You know, so it's any time that you can sever any communications, you know, and shut down the troll farms, you know, and the botnets and stuff like that, you're controlling that narrative, right? You know, and I applaud these companies for doing this. Because, you know, like we said, we're all in the same playing field here, you know, and we're all in the same sandbox. Who's playing dirty, you know, and they're trying to say, you know, without saying it, hey, this was bad. What you did is bad. What This is wrong. So guess what? We're going to take this part of what you could abuse out of our company away from you, basically away from everybody, which, you know, uh, we've seen this happen during election cycles. I'm not getting into that, but we've seen this happen before when you know we've seen threat actors and i'm just going to put it in those terms as, as blank as I, use these kind of techniques to influence a populace and a population to do something either to misinform them you know guide their vote a different way or guide their you know uh decision a different way we see this in advertising a lot and in marketing a lot right you know they show the box of cereal with the kid eating the cereal, even though it might taste like you're chewing on, you know, uh, cardboard. But guess what? They got smiles and they're talking all about it and how it keeps you, you know, regular all on the inside. Well, that's awesome. Great. What are you going to do? You're going to go buy that because it's the influence that's being pumped into you to go buy that thing. Same thing that we're dealing with here, but we're dealing with it in a wartime. So we're taking the same mode and method that you would see in marketing and strategy to be able to be used in a wartime, you know, theater. So it, it's very interesting to to see these things happen because these companies have never taken a stance like this before. Mm -hmm. Normally they're kind of like, I mean, even when Switzerland gets involved, I mean, come on, they, these guys, you know, step, you know, are getting involved now and they weren't even involved during world war one and world war two. So what's that tell you? So what they're doing is, is they're actually getting involved with saying, okay, this is a bad thing, either good or bad. So we're going to take it away from everyone, you know, mm -hmm. and we're going to pull that technology or we're going to pull that service back to where it can't be used to do harm. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it's, it's unescapable that big tech was going to get involved also uh, with, with, with all of this, just because of the level of integration and entrenchment that big tech has now with modern society. Um, so it's no surprise. I'm just glad that they are getting involved in a way that I, you know, at least I think is a positive way. It, so it's true. I mean, cause they've tried to be neutral for so long and they've just found out we've got to take a stance sometime, you know, mm -hmm. and w let's do this one. Cause this is kind of a good, this is kind of a good test bed for them to try something for like this out because, you know, the Ukraine has, you know, uh, a certain populace that goes between borders because, you know, you've got Ukrainians that speak Russian, you've got your, your, your Russians that speak U Ukrainian and so forth. So it kind of transcends. So it kind of puts everybody kind of back on that equal playing field again, but they're really kind of using this as a test bed to say, okay, we really want to make sure that someone does not abuse our Instagram platform or our meta platform or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. So this is actually kind of a, I consider this to be a very good thing. And it sets a precedent that's saying, hey, we do did this once before and if something happens like this uh, you know again because you do have china looking at taiwan right now going mm, tasty you know <laughs> so you know we might be we might see something like this again in the future you know to where yeah. these guys take a stance to say hey this was a bad idea for people to use this and this is not what was originally intended to do so let's take this away you know and put a little warning label on it so the final piece of, of the, the timeline that I want to talk about that would bring us right up until, uh, you know, today uh, is this idea that there has been essentially a request from Ukraine by the world, the countries of the world to help and the countries of the world, um, you know, have helped in by sending some supplies and stuff and, you know, using NATO and stuff like that. But there hasn't been uh, full full, you know, deployment of forces effectively. So we've seen Ukraine call on you know people of the world especially cybersecurity or technical people to join they're calling it uh IT army uh and effectively we, I don't have the tweet right now but there is a telegram channel where like the defense minister is literally just listing targets and it's like open hunting season nobody is legitimately authorizing these individuals to take these operations uh but Ukraine is kind of 
it's, you know, I guess thrown, thrown to the side uh, policy or whatever and, and done this. So um, I want to, I want to continue to one quick point and then get your thoughts on it, uh, Chip. So what we have seen is things like uh, a call to arms where anonymous uh, most famously so far oh, yeah. ha has, has rised up. They made a little three minute video. Uh, they have, definitely taken out some things i heard that moscow stock exchange went down on tuesday um so there is some real uh this is real and it's really happening and on the other side we're seeing uh conti ransomware gang for example came out and said anyone that supported uh ukraine would be ransomware by them and then their their faction splinters out so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people involved and in, while you're talking i'll pull up a list that someone's actually maintaining of all the threat actor groups um, and what their alliances are. But but what I wanted to ask you, Chip, not so much that this is happening or the idea behind it, but Malware Jake on, on Twitter, who does great work, love love what mm -hmm. he posts. He posts a lot of oh, funny, yeah. funny tweets too. But he basically says in this long tweet that I'll link in chat in a second, that by the, the problem is by requesting, a, you know, in a decentralized uh, attack, you actually could have people who don't know what they're doing undermining actual intelligence operations because let's just say for the sake of ease that uh, the a government agency has compromised the machine, but in an espionage like way, so the, 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 the compromised victim or whatever does not know you're there. So you're intercepting intelligence. You're constantly aware of operations and military movements and stuff like that. And then you have... IT army blasting this machine off the network, uh, which right. is going to blow up your Intel operation. So, you know, so that's the other side of the coin. So I, I want your thoughts around what do you think about this particular approach? It's it's a 50 50. You mean you ever heard the, the, the term there's too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, kind of deal. Mm hmm. Even they're trying to do the good, you know, trying to cook a, you know, four course meal and everybody's trying to cook dinner for each other or trying to cook dinner, period. You got too many people that are piled into the kitchen doing exactly what you just talked about, right? You know, you got somebody running a, you know, espionage, you know, uh, very subtle, you know, operation. And then you get, you know, gangbusters coming here, you know, and just wreck it, right? So, well, that's compromised. That one went down, you know, the, the, the IT, you know, or compromised toilet. You know, there's nothing you can do. So, you know, and that, that is, that's, that, that's all. And the other thing you got, you, you put a call out on 4chan, you know, and you say, Hey, everybody, you know, from anonymous, come help us, you know, and they're a very political, you know, based group. And then you've got a very, you know, it, it's a, it's a tit <laughs> goes back to that tit for, you know, tick for talk, tit for tat warfare again, is that, you know, uh, when the Ukraine said, Hey, we, you know, we need a cyber army. Who says the Israelis, Unit 8200? Who says the NSA, the CIA? Who says, who says you know, um, the British intelligence? You know, I mean, German intelligence. I mean, that, that gives everybody free reign to do whatever they want, you know, because you just said, you know, as the prime minister or the premier of your or the president of your country, hey, help us stop all this from happening. So, you know, yet again, the Internet knows no bounds. You opened it up for every nation, you know, in the world to either help or hurt you, you know. So, and then you've got the other groups, you know, that are in uh, the attacker versus the defender. Okay, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. That are as political as well, that might be state sponsored, you know, or not state sponsored. Say, okay, we're going to attack, you know, you because you are trying to help them, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, um, children in a sandbox fighting for the toy. You know, and, and, you know, and then they, then they start pulling the toy, then they start punching each other. Then it just turns out to a full out brawl. You know, and uh, it's just waiting to see who gets jealous first, as I, you know, as I termed it the other day, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and who wants to take credit for what, you know, and then you, you'll never know. Either it'll be, you know, uh, the proper thing to do or the improper thing to do. So that coin flips both ways. You know, the door swings both ways for a reason, you know, and uh, it, it's a good thing that they did this because first off, they've realized, first off, not only do they need bullets, guns and tanks, they need a cyber army. You know, so mm -hmm. it was kind of very introspective for the Ukraine to find out like, hey, we need something like, you know, the rest of the state nations do, you know, 
and we need to have that, but, you know, and we also need to join NATO and we also need to do this. And, you know, they're finding out that, you know, they, for 30 years, they should have been, you know, really concentrating on something like this, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like Poland has, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Poland, but I mean, they're ready to go. I mean, and they've got forces ready there with U S military bases as well. So they're kind of learning the hard way, you know, that, that some of these things need to be done and not only just investing in bullet and guns, but also investing in, you know, educated people that want to come work for our government to help protect our infrastructure, you know, and our banking and our intellectual property, you know, so because they're, I think they've just gotten to the point they're sick of being the test bed for, you know, every kind of Russian attack that's out there. Mm -hmm. We've seen this with Black Energy. We've seen this with Sandworm. We've seen this with, you know, Operation Dragonfly, you know, over the years. I mean, these guys have been beat down and beat down. And then sometimes they're going to stand up instead of getting hit in the face with, you know, a fist, they're going to grab a stick. And that's where we're at right now is they're, they have stood up and they said, if you've got the skills, bring it, you know, mm-hmm. and then you've got on the flip side of the, to the defenders going, okay, bring it, bring it on. We're, we'll, we will, we'll, we see if we can take it or not. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, also just to kind of close out uh, the, the thought of this, this discussion, you know, when you're faced, when you're pushed into a corner and I mean, you're, you're literally yeah. at risk of losing your country, you pull out all the stops and, and, you know, you, you do what you need to do to protect your Home. You go, I mean, it's it's no different than mother protecting her child. They go feral quick. I mean, <laughs> and that's what you're seeing yeah. is, you know, these people are fighting for not only their livelihoods, but they're fighting for their country. And, you know, and that's where that, and I mean, I give them all, I mean, well, I saw the other day they had a beer company that was there that's now not making beer. They're making Molotov cocktails and giving them to, you know, yeah. normal people. And then <laughs> they that. start giving, you know, they said, okay, we enact our own kind of like second amendment. Now we're giving everybody guns, you know. So they're, they're, they're learning, you know, and, and yeah. the thing though, too, is in the, and that's getting, you know, in the school of hard knocks. I mean, they're, they're learning the hard way as much as I hate to admit it. Yeah. Well, Chip, thank you. I know we went a little over time, but I thought that this conversation was very, very germane to what is going on in the world, especially oh, with a, a cybersecurity bend. Uh, you know, thank you to chat for being here. You guys, I, I appreciate it. Keeping it apolitical, focusing on, you know, what has transpired, how it's transpired, the military and operational value chip. You're uh, a lot of people said a lot of nice things in chat about you. You definitely bring it. Uh, thank you for being a guest on Simply Cyber and no uh, helping us helping us understand and really appreciate what is happening uh, in Eastern Europe right now. Well, as I tell people, you know, uh, you know, join me on LinkedIn, you know, the door to knowledge is always open. You know, I speak to a a lot of people like you that are influencers within our industry, you know, and I do a lot of these, you know, uh, cast, you know, and podcast to talk to people, you know, to bring them the awareness that, you know, when you talk about IT being at the table in every decision, you need to have OT there as well, you know, Mm -hmm. and since I'm on the, since I'm on both sides of the fence on, you know, and I deal, you know, mostly with healthcare, you know, and the banking industry. And that's been my any kind of background and whatnot. You know, they, these are things, these are really hard, expensive conversations that you have to have because yeah. everybody thinks it's just a maintenance problem. Well, no, it's not just a maintenance problem, you know, and then they think, oh, it's a maintenance manager problem. No, there, there's more that goes into it than, than, than that. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this, this, you know, once this conflict is hopefully resolved soon, uh, a lot of that, you know, will be case study to point to and say, you know, this is why it's not just maintenance, it's it's required. So mm-hmm. uh, before we close out, I do want to remind everybody that every morning we are doing the top uh, news stories, the Simply Cyber Cybersecurity Morning Threat Briefing, also called First Things First. So uh, if you enjoyed the stream uh, next Thursday, we're going to actually be having um, uh, a bug bounty uh, related stream. So that'll be exciting. Uh, but tomorrow, obviously there's going to be a lot of Ukraine, Russia stuff, uh, in the news as it continues to unfold. Uh, please join us, go to simplycyber.io slash FTF in order to get pushed right to, you know, the next live stream and you'll be able to see it there. And Chip, Chip will be there. Chip, you're usually joining us in the morning, aren't you? Oh yeah. It's, it's depending on which time zone I'm working in that day. Well, yeah, of course, of course. (laughs) All right. Well, that's going to do it for uh, this week's Simply Cyber, guys. Thank you so much all for being here, and we will see you next time. So until next time, stay secure.